Welcome back to the That Church Podcast. My name is Kendall Harness. I am one of your hosts. I co-host this podcast with my dad, Pastor Scott Harness. And uh, we, we stop. We host this podcast for two reasons. Uh, number one is that it is an extension of the weekend service. So we get to share content that we don't usually get to share. We share it here. We also confront really hard questions here. But the third, the second thing, good. not really third, second, uh, is that we are helping people with what is called biblical biblical literacy, where we desire for people to be reading their Bible. That's what we want. We want people reading their Bible. So we're trying to help people get excited, get interested in their Bibles. The Bible is the most factual book ever written. It is also the most interesting book ever written, and you need to be reading it. Today, we got some energy drinks, though, some new ones. I picked these up at our local uh, little store. These are C4. So we got C4s. C4s. I have the <clears throat> Arctic Snow Cone. What do you mm, have? I've got orange cream. Now, C4, when I was in the military, was a uh, an explosive, plastic explosive. Well, let's hope that's not what this so, is. Yeah. Wow, that's kind of explosive. Cheers, good. Open. Again, we're still looking for a Christian energy drink company. I've still not found yeah. one. I did a little research this week, and I couldn't find one. Oh, really? But C4. Mm-hmm. Uh. <laughs> That's pretty good. Is yours good? Dude, mine is. Is it really good? Dang. That is the old-fashioned push-up ice cream. Is that what it is? Push yeah. pops? A little fun push pops? Man. That's delicious. Mm. <clears throat> mine is, um, it's interesting. Okay. So with that out of the way, it is time. And if you want to, these were recommended to us to C4 was, if you want to recommend energy drinks for us to try, drop in the comments below and we will try them. Um, not sponsored by any of them, by yeah, the way. No. Um, so with that said, let's jump into this podcast. This podcast is is on prayer, and the title is, Have You Been Praying Wrong? Yep. Um, I think we can all attest that prayer has power, um, at least in, in the Christian world. Uh, we all believe pretty much, even across kind of cultural and religious borders, people pretty much believe that prayer has power in some way, shape, or form. Um, prayer in its most simplest form is communication between us and God. Uh, that's that's the that's the simplest. We'll talk about what is prayer a little bit more in a minute. But before we do, I do want to tell a quick story. Um, so a few years ago, this is a while ago, actually, several years ago, I was still a kid. Um <laughs> We were going, I think we were going out of town. I think we were going to the lake uh, mm -hmm. for something. And we're on our way to the lake and we pull up to a gas station or something. And there's this other really nice fancy truck uh, with a nice boat on it. And this guy gets out and it's this guy with this other woman. And um, the guy walks up. Well, you recognize the guy immediately. Uh, and then he, But uh, I didn't recognize the woman. You didn't recognize the woman. So there's this guy that <laughs> we I knew. But I didn't know his wife. But yeah, we knew his wife, but he wasn't with her. He was with another woman and uh, he wanted to talk to dad. So dad and this guy start talking, right? Everything's cool, whatever. And at the end of the conversation, conversation kind of fizzles out. And dad goes, hey, I want to pray with y'all. Can we pray with y'all before you go? And uh, they're like, yeah, whatever. We'll pray together. So we grab hands. Everybody's in a big circle outside front of the little piggly wiggly, whatever it was. And uh, dad starts praying. Normal thing. God, we love you. Great. Having a great, whatever, praying, whatever you pray for. God, dad's praying through it. And about a quarter of the way into the prayer, dad starts to just kind of deviate from uh from normal prayer prayer language dad's like um i pray god that you remind this man of his wife back at home and that he should not be out running around with other women i pray that the brakes go out on the truck and i pray that the boat sinks today and grows ferry and all these <laughs> prayers and he's like the guy and you could tell like you know it got uncomfortable about that point guy's looking up and he's like hey and and finally dad says hey Amen. You know, amen locks it in. You know, it's like, no, no going back once there's an amen. And this guy's like, you take that back. Take that prayer back. And this guy, and dad's like, I'm not taking it back. That's it. Have a good day. Have a good day. Have a good day. And then, there we go. Right off to the car. Um, dad's done prayed and prayed all kinds of sickness in this guy's life. And he's prayed his dog to die and everything else. I mean, it's just, it's a whole thing. Um, um, anyway, that was Pastor Scott, just so we're clear, um, maybe in his younger days. But anyway, um, but with that, though, prayer, though, has power. It has That's power. Right. It, right. is, it does. Um, I do want to say this before we get all the way into it. Like I say, uh, you wrote a book. 
Um, a legit book. Uh, it's called More Than Happy. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring it up is because with the More Than Happy book, when we it's on Amazon, still for sale right now. Yep. Uh, you can purchase one wherever books are sold. Um, but with that, though, we released what's called the 21 Days of Happy, which is a 21-day prayer journal that the staff wrote That's right. um, here at that church to accompany your book. And the 21-day prayer journal is actually free. And um, we'll put the link in the description to this. You can download that. It goes along with the book, but you could read it without the book as well. Sure, sure. Um, but it's a 21 day prayer <clears throat> journal. So prayer has been a pretty big part of that church's history in a general sense um, for all of us and, and pieces. So with that, um, have you been praying wrong? Have you been praying wrong? What are kind of your initial thoughts on, on prayer? Well, one of the things we're going to actually cover at the very end of this mm -hmm. is the number one mistake. I mean, absolutely categorically, I can say it without it's any doubt. One. It is the number one mistake that, that every Christian has made when it comes to prayer. Mm. And it is a, it is a, a deadly mistake. Mm. So if you are making this mistake, your prayers, number one, are not, not going to be answered. Mm. Um, and it's not going to go well for you. So that's at oh. the end of this. So some of you are going to try to fast forward to it. And if you do... I don't know what might happen to you, really. No, <laughs> no, but Scott's gonna pray that for is going to be the last thing we're going to talk about, though, is the number one mistake. So, 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 been praying wrong. Have we been praying wrong? I think there's some stuff that we ought to look at when it comes to prayer and, you know, um, how we should pray. And you and I talked about looking at the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. And spending some time there and just walking through. Because if there's through. anyone who can teach us how to pray, it would be God himself through Jesus Christ. No, without I, I, would think, I would think he'd be the expert well, on this. And the one thing I love about this passage, it, it, we, we, when we dive into this passage, the, the apostles have literally asked Jesus, they've asked him, they said, you know, how should we pray? Yeah. So how, how are we doing this? You know, how, how should we do this? Yeah. Sure. And so it's Matthew 16, right? Isn't that right? Mm. Or is it 18? For the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. Matthew 6, 5. 6. I don't know why. Six. I, I was thinking, you said 16, it threw me off. I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> is it in 16? I'm like, no, right. it's in 6. I don't know why. It threw a whole extra <laughs> one in there. Sorry anyway, about that. Keep going. So, so the disciples asked him, they said, you know, you know, how should we pray? What should that look like? And by the way, we call this the Lord's Prayer, but this is really not the Lord's Prayer. No. This, this is a prayer where Jesus is teaching us. It's a model prayer. Yeah, it's a model prayer. He's teaching us how to pray. And and he starts off, and this is in verse number five of, of Matthew chapter six. He says, and I love the first three words. He says, when you pray. Yeah, when. You're going to see that a couple of times in these passages of, you know, around the Sermon on the Mount thing, is you're going to see where where Jesus is making certain assumptions. And one of the assumptions that's made about prayer is that prayer is not something extraordinary. We act like prayer is extraordinary in the Christian life. We we use it as a, a discipline. Sure. Um, we'll say that prayer is something that, you know, we're trying to get our brain wrapped around. But prayer actually, this, this, this prayer... Um, and and prayer, I want to I want to say one more thing. Prayers, we've said prayer is a conversation with God, but it's actually not. Actually, prayer is you and I, and we are conveying an intentional message to God. Hmm, sure. um, anytime God speaks back to us, that's never re referenced in Scripture as prayer. That's referenced as revelation or illumination. Sure. Um, God reveals things. He shows us things through his word. But God doesn't pray to us. <clears throat> but God to doesn't communicate. pray to us. That's yeah. right. Sure. Prayer, sure. prayer denotes a lesser speaking to a greater. Mm. Because prayer has a certain position. It has a certain attitude. It has a certain perspective. And all of that, when we're speaking to God... That's prayer. Now, can someone have a conversation with God in their prayer life? They can, but a conversation means that I'm hearing back from the other. Sure. If you couple scripture, biblical reading, you scripture, you 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 couple it with with meditation, um, being quiet, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you, a conversation can be had. But sure. prayer, prayer in its purest form in Scripture is us relating a very intentional message to God. Um, we are saying something very intentional and specific to God in a certain way. And so Jesus said, when you pray, this should be a normal thing. That means that sure. I should very consistently be conveying an intentional message to God when you pray. It should be happening. And Jesus said this. He said, don't be like the hypocrites um, who love to pray publicly on the street corner and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. Um, I tell you the truth that, that that is all the reward that they'll get. And so in other words... What he's saying is he's saying that prayer is specifically us wanting to have an audience with God 
It's not about having an audience with everybody else. Prayer is not about other people hearing my prayer. It's not about, and I know so many times, especially I remember when I first got, you know, really back into church and I was a young Christian. I'd been saved since I was a little kid, but I didn't get back in church until, um, it's it's after flight school, you sure. know, and so in the military, yeah, so in the military, ad, very <laughs> much so into adulthood, yeah, and and you know, I was very intimidated because you would hear certain people pray and their prayers were so like, wow, you right. know, you're like, man, they've got all these cool words to say, and and when they would pray, you'd be like, wow, that's a cool phrase, sure, and, and stuff just came to them, you know, and I prayed like somebody with a speech impediment, you know, I was <laughs> like, uh, God, uh, you know, I mean. And, and that, you know, it's, it's not about that at all. It's, sure. it's, it's particularly not about people, you know, that you're um, around you, them hearing you pray. It's, sure. it's not about that as all, at, at all. It's just this conversation that I'm going to have with God. I think it was Billy Sunday <clears throat> was in the White House many, many years ago. And he was praying. They were having like a prayer breakfast thing or mm-hmm. whatever. And I don't remember who the president was, but the pre- he, was, he was praying um, at one of the table, the president's at the other end of the table, and there's a whole bunch of dignitaries and, you know, whoever Whatever it is, they, religious yeah, sure. people there. And the, the president kept saying, hey, I can't hear him while Billy Sunday was praying. He said, hey, I can't hear him. Billy Sunday just keeps praying. And he says, hey, I can't hear him. And finally gets finished. He says, hey, he says, I couldn't hear you while you were praying. And Billy Sunday said, I wasn't talking to you. It's <laughs> <laughs> true, so, though. It's true, though. So, so I think one of the things Jesus says, he says that if I'm praying or or even any really pretty much any religious activity that I'm doing, in hopes that other people will see me, God discounts that. He doesn't pay attention sure. to it. So, sure. and the reward you're going to get is when her, I is, heard somebody pray. They saw you. Yeah, yeah. I heard somebody pray and I was like, wow, they had really cool things to say. And I was impressed with it. I can be impressed with it, but the world doesn't change. My world doesn't change. My life doesn't change because somebody around me is impressed by what I sure. said or otherwise. So, sure. so that's one. Verse six. Yep. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself and shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private then your father who sees everything will reward you. And yep. so Jesus said, go be by yourself. I believe without a doubt what he's saying in this passage is, is that you need to get in a place where, number one, you can focus and concentrate, mm-hmm. and number two, you're not role-playing. Sure. The moment my focus in prayer shifts away from God and what I'm telling him and my relationship with him, and it shifts to something else, my prayer is rendered ineffective. I agree with and that. So, and so I think it, that I think that it is important <clears throat> to note that you know there's there's nothing wrong with public prayer, but I think it no, is no, important. Yeah. But I think it is important though that when you look at Jesus's life throughout Scripture, Jesus intentionally finds time to be by himself to pray. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that doesn't mean that you can't pray in public and that public prayers are ineffective. But what that does mean is that often the temptation whenever you're publicly praying is to pay attention to what everyone else is thinking. And often the, and when you talk to people in religious circles, I talk to people all the time. I'm like, would you pray at this thing? And a lot of people say no. And you're like, why won't you pray at this thing? Well, I'm worried about what, you know, I don't want to say, say something wrong or I don't want to whatever. And it's like, well, again, I do understand that. I do get that. And that is, you know, legitimate concern or whatever. But again, prayer is not public speaking. Prayer is that I'm communicating with God. Now, the hard part about that, and I'm not communicating with God, but like you said, sending a, a, a intentional message, intentional yeah. message to God. Um, but, but I think that the, the point that you want to make is that, you know, yes, when you do that in public, there is some, some public speaking portion to that probably, but at the same time, more so, it's really designed to be just a letter to God that you send to him and what everyone else thinks about it. It's just another business. Um, yeah, you know, it's not, it's not really for them. It's for him. And so how do we pray? Well, based off the Lord's prayer, um, and those types of things, we pray, um, in conversation to God straight to him, uh, and, and we prioritize him and that's kind of how that, that works out. Yeah. And I think too, that, <clears throat> and we're going to do a one verse, um, sort of, uh, I don't know what we're going to call that, uh, video. Video, where, yeah. Where we're breaking apart single verses. And the first verse, and we've already started the research on it, is James 5, 16. Mm-hmm. And, and it says that, that it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, that's in the King James Version. And when I looked at the original text on that verse, what it's actually saying is, it's saying the prayer of a righteous person is made effective. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so what James is saying, and it's the same thing Jesus is saying here, he's saying that my prayers, it's not about my prayer. Okay. It's about the one who hears my prayer. Okay. So the power is not in my prayer or even in the, the particular words that I use. The prayer is in the one who's hearing my prayer. 
And so, and when he hears my prayer, my prayer is made effective. But 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 that effective that effective prayer, I think you have to keep this in mind. That effective prayer that we're talking about, your prayer is rendered ineffective the moment that that intentional message that you're sending, you consider it as it is being heard by somebody other than God. Mm, so in other words, okay. it becomes ineffective when I start thinking, Kendall's hearing me pray. Let me say something cool. You get worried about so that. So that sure. Kendall, can, Kendall can go, and when you get finished, Kendall goes, oh, that was a good prayer. The moment that I'm more concerned about what someone else thinks mm. about my prayer or I'm more concerned about how they receive the prayer, then it's intentional um, direction to God is the moment it becomes ineffective. Okay. So, so the reason why Jesus is <clears throat> is promoting private prayer is because when I'm by myself and it's just me and God and I'm quiet and I'm alone, then at that particular moment, I don't have any reason to role play. There's not somebody mm. around that I'm going, oh gosh, I hope they think I'm super spiritual or sure. whatever. That it private takes that prayer away. And I would, I would just throw it out there. I believe private prayer is probably one of the least taken advantage of, but probably most important practices of Christians. I agree. We don't. We just don't do it. We don't do it enough. And we throw we throw it out there like this. We'll say, well, you know, I can pray anytime. When we can pray anytime, and that's true. But but Jesus Himself. Now this is God in the flesh. So you got to think this is God speaking to you about what mm-hmm. He wants. Jesus says, "I want most your attention on me." When you're talking to me, sure. When you're talking to me, I want it to be about me. Limit everything else, and yep. and so the best way for you to do that is for you to be alone. Yeah. And so if Jesus says that's the best way, what's interesting is Jesus says it's the best way. That is probably the one way that is most under attack in our lives. Yeah. Think about it. Think about it. Certainly, I can pray while I'm driving. Sure. Certainly, I can. I can pray while I'm watching TV. Sure. I can pray when I'm with a bunch of people. I can pray when I'm in a crowd. I'm in a small group. Sure. We're gonna talk about praying. In a small you can group. be praying. Yeah. You can pray. But Jesus said the absolute one way, that most effective way, the one I like the most is when you're really, really focused on me. And you can do that best when you're alone. That is the one thing we do the least. And think about how little of time oh, and, yeah. and alone and the ability to be alone we even have in today's day and age. And even when you can be alone, you have something like your cell phone, which is just the ability, That's exactly to, right. the ability to leave where you are currently and go somewhere else without having to physically move. It's like, you know... 20 years ago, you know, the cell yep. phone, you weren't able to, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to go to the phone to get it, but now your phone goes with you. It's like, yep. no, so I read a study can Look, never be alone. <clears throat> I'm sorry to mean her. Go, 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 go. But I read a study the other day that exactly said that, said that, said that today we are never alone. Never. And so Jesus said, here's the one thing I want you to do. I want you to get alone and then your prayer life has become, will become really And I'm not effective. saying the devil invented the cell phone, but I am saying yeah. this. He's for sure using it. I mean, it's like, it man, It does have an amazing. Apple bit out of it. I'm <laughs> telling you, man, that thing still, that logo still bothers me. How does that. that happen? There's that. He says, when you pray, Jesus goes on, he gives us some more things to think about. He says, when you pray, he said, don't babble on as um, the Gentiles do. Sure. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words. Now think about this. You remember what on... Um, I think it was Mount Carmel where Elijah and the false prophets yeah. of Baal. Remember how the the big deal they did? They yeah, yelled and they were crying. And Elijah, and he's, Elijah's like, I don't think he heard you. You better yell yeah, a little better louder. Yell louder yeah. And they got all lathered up. And when they were finished, they were just like oh, exhausted. You know? yeah. yeah, you know. And uh, and then Elijah just spoke and yeah. God heard it. And you know, so um the the Gentiles, the prayer, the the people that are non believers, the prayer event is the production. Sure. And how many people today are in a religion, uh, in a denomination that everything's about emotion. Everything's got to be super spiritual. Even in Christian circles, yeah, it's absolutely. Sad how often and we so, elevate that? So we have this big production of something because we got to elicit an emotion, um, and and in that event, the event becomes a subject. Mm. Prayer, God should be the subject. It is the con. It is, it is a, it is a, a, a an intentional message sent to God. Sure. <clears throat> and um, I think those are things that we need to think about. Well, he says. Go ahead. Well, and even the idea that Jesus says, you know, he's like, and, and that'll be the reward that you get. How many people come out of a prayer service that's super emotional and they come out and they're all supercharged and they're all yeah. like, I, I feel, I feel, and they'll say blessed. I feel blessed coming out of that service because that service was so uplifting. I think those words could still ring true that Jesus says that goes, that's the reward you're going to get out of that, which I think is not a ding against the prayer service. It's just, you have to understand <clears throat> if the prayer service became the focus that the encouragement you received that's it. Um, well, it's not going any further than that. Well, I met with a pastor um, and coached a pastor um, from Belize a few weeks back. Yeah. And we sat and talked for a good long while. <clears throat> um, 
Stacy and I are going to Belize in a couple of few weeks and we're going to lead some leadership training. And we were talking and one of the guys that was there that was with us when we were, you know, kind of putting this thing together, he said, how would you like for, you know, Scott to come and lead a service and do some cool stuff? He said, I'd love for that. He said, but, and people will come. He said, but what we need is discipleship. Wow. And, and here's what he said. He said, all of our churches about five years ago were absolutely packed full of people. He said, a huge revival breaks out. He said, the churches are packed full of people. He said, there's all these people getting saved and everything else. And he said, but there's no discipleship. And he said, those churches afterwards, when the emotion ended, when all of the theatrics ended, he said, those people went away. And he said, Never came back. He said we're way worse off than we wow. ever were. He said, wow. poverty, alcoholism, drug use, suicide, uh, you name it. He said, broken marriages, sure. prostitution. He said, everything is through the roof. He said, it's infinitely worse than what it was before. He said, we don't need an experience. He said, we need disciples. Yeah. We need people who are being yeah. transformed. So he wants us to come and lead leadership, teaching leaders how to build disciples and make disciples. Sure. And so it's a fantastic perspective though, because I think a lot of times, <clears throat> a lot of times we can get distracted by ringing the bell of a number or an achievement of some kind. And, and you think about that in the idea of one day. And then from there, you don't think about what happens after that. Um, and, and even like when you look at, and this is not to ding the revival itself, but you look at even Asbury, when you looked at the, at the revival there, fantastic. 50,000 people show up in one day, but all those people left and they eventually went home. And it's like, and I mean, they have to, to a degree, like, yeah, whatever. And, and so again, that's not to take anything away from that. But at the same time, you do have to kind of think, What's more important, a single experience or a long-term life change? Yeah, and I think if you inventory inv individual, you know, responses to what happened there. Sure. In the end, and the same thing's true about prayer, God must remain the subject. And mm. by the way, that's a constant amendment. Throughout that You have to be mending that because in your life, there's times where you're, you know, you're carrying out good, solid Christian activities in your home sure. or whatever, and the activity becomes the subject. Sure. In your church, there's yeah. times where you're pursuing really good things, things that we were asked to do, make disciples, sure. but the disciple's still not the subject. Right. Or you're evangelizing, reaching people who are lost, but the lost still aren't the, the subject. subject. Sure. God is always the subject. And so sure. in this prayer, what Jesus is trying to, to clarify for us is it's not about prayer being some type of event, but prayer is just the opportunity and the segue of us having this chance to have a, a to have an, an opportunity to talk to our God. Sure. And and we need to do that. Sure. Um, I love what he says. He says, don't be like the, the pagans. That's the people who keep saying things over and over and right. making big theatrics out of it. He said, for your father knows exactly what you need. I think it's important of what he says here. And he points out the relationship. The relationship is this. You're not talking just to anybody. Sure. You're talking to your father. Sure. So, so Jesus is, you know, don't overlook this truth that when you're talking to God, this, these, these, and these things you're conveying to him, you're conveying them to your father. And he goes on to say this, it's not about repetition as far as like forcing God's hand. Um, but what it is about, it is about you having this conversation or having this talk with, with, with your father, um, which is hugely important. He says, so here, here's how you pray. Sure. So here's the mom. Here's Jesus. Here's Jesus breaking down how exactly prayer takes place. Yep. It should take place. And he emphasizes some really important stuff here. He yep. says, he says, our father, which by the way, if you'll notice the model prayer that Jesus gives us is a prayer that's prayed in community. Sure. He doesn't say my father. Yep. He says our father. And so it's kind of interesting that I think he embraces at this particular moment the, the power of communal prayer, sure. praying with other people. Although he's told us to go into our prayer closet sure. and to pray by yourself, that is important. But now he's also embracing this communal prayer. Our Father <clears throat> in heaven, so he tells us where, where he is. He says, may your name be kept holy or hallowed be your name. Um, and what he's talking about here is, is he's saying the name of God should be held at a certain level of honor. Why? Because God's name is his identity. Where God is realized and recognized for who he is, there's unbelievable power. Yeah. See, that, that where God is realized and recognized for who he is, there's direction, there's purpose, there's salvation. In fact, the Bible says there's salvation given to, uh, there's salvation in no other name other than, than Jesus. The, that's right. Yep. No other name given among men um, whereby you must be saved. Um, at the mighty name of Jesus, every knee, every head will bow and every knee will bend. Um, so, so there's direction, purpose, salvation. There's security and so much more. And so the first thing that Jesus establishes is the importance of the positioning of God. Yeah. He's in heaven. He's above us. Yep. He is over us. He is above all. He is over all. Um, I, think, I think that first statement, 
tells me my position, you know, and it tells me because I know God's position. You know where at that church we have this green light. Yeah, the little, little Dorito. Arrow, little Dorito. Keep going, yep. um, came from a mall map. You're yep. here. One of the most important things that we can know as we pray, study the Bible, seek to follow God or anything is where is God? And when you know where God is, you'll know where you are. Yeah. So um, on a mall map, it doesn't matter. You won't know where you are if you don't know where the mall is. Yeah. So on the mall map, it doesn't just say you're here and give you an arrow and say you're and you're here in relation to the mall. Sure. Where you are doesn't matter if you don't know where you are in relation to the mall. It gives you no help. You don't know where you are in life or anything else until you know where God is. And so Jesus says, let's establish this index. So when you know where God is, God is in heaven. His name is holy. That means he's above all. He is beyond all. He is over all. He is God. When I establish that, my prayer life's right. I'm praying. I'm not demanding. I'm not. Um, I'm not empowered because I'm entitled. I am here humbly as a servant before my God, who's in control of all things. And so that's how he starts this prayer off. He says, "May your kingdom come soon." In other words, God's kingdom is where God is always kept and held in the position He should be in. Yep. So He says, "May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven." What mm -hmm. What's happening in heaven? God's being yep. honored. God's being esteemed. He's in the position he's supposed to be in. He's being obeyed. Um, he says, give us um, the food we need. Give us today the food we need. Um, and so he goes into these very simple things. Why does he ask for that? Because when I receive simple things in life, when I recognize that all of them have been given to me by God, then when I need to request something bigger, it doesn't seem like God has been away from me for a long time. Sure. You said something that I think is so profoundly powerful, that revival isn't God showing up. Revival is when we realize that God has been there all along. Sure. And so Jesus said, we're going to pray for our daily food. That means that every time something, I have something in my life, you know, I realize that came from God. Yeah. So, so my connectivity to God, my relationship with God, the breath that I just drew in, it was given to me by God. The lungs that could draw it in, given to me by God. The heart that's pumping that oxygen out to the rest of my body, given to me. The energy that, that I can do that. All well, and that's the and that's even God. the even the name of of God, the Yahweh. You know, the when we talk about that, you know, Yahweh is the original name of God, and it's to and it's to resemble a breath. It's the breath in, yeah, the yeah, breath yeah. out. That's which right. is God <clears throat> is the breath of life. So every time I take a breath, it's it's God in, it's God out, and that's yep. and that's that breath is sustaining me. You can't hold your breath and live. It's like you'll die very soon. Um, sooner than you'll starve. Sooner than you'll die of you know thirst. You'll die of holding your breath way faster. Um, and so it's because that, you know, you're sustained. Every breath is by God, which is where I do think Jesus is acknowledging that. And in that he's teaching us to say, Hey, you know, even the smallest things of your life, not only are they given to you by God, but God cares about those things. Oh yeah. And that's like, how often do we act as though the things that we even pray for are beneath God that, we're oh, like, yeah. oh, well, God doesn't care about that. I mean, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's just something that I would like or whatever, or something that I need, but you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. Does God really care about my stuff and it's like yeah he does i mean that jesus says to pray about it that's those are things that absolutely cares about him and and i think in some of that it's not the size of it's not necessarily the size of what we're asking for what's really our struggle is the size of the god that's granting them oh so it's as if we feel like god is limited so if i ask god for something that i feel is small that's really beneath him because God's limited. He's he's a commodity. He can You're only right, sure. he can only do so many things. We ex, we experienced a miracle in our life last week with yeah. Sammy Joe, Sammy Joanne being healed. Okay, but so does that mean I okay? I've used my miracles up for the year, so I better sure. not ask again. That's it. But, yeah, you know, and we don't have a, any record in Scripture where God does something miraculous and then afterwards he needs to rest. Sure. You know, you watch Gandalf, you know, <laughs> and he's like, you know, doing something powerful. And then after he's like, oh, he just collapses he's to the tired, floor. Yeah. God doesn't do that. God, God doesn't. doesn't get tired. God only rested on the seventh day as a pattern for us. He didn't do it because he was really tired. Sure. God rested on the seventh day from his work so that you would know what you have to do. But think about this for a second. Mine did too. Hey, yeah, they all stopped. It's over 30 minutes. What? <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was telling you. I was like, it's coming. Verse 14. Uh, yep, verse 14. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. So this is still in Jesus teaching us how to pray. Um, and so one of the things he says is, is that, first of all, again, positioning of God, God has the authority to forgive you, and you need his forgiveness. Yep. But to, to agree with the same 
and be unified in alignment with God, you use your authority to forgive to forgive as well. Mm, and so, okay. so, and he says this, he's saying that he says, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. So in other words, my relationship to God, the father is going to be out of balance and messed up when I don't practice the pattern that he's established. Mm. So in other words, he establishes the wave and I continue the wave. In his his establishment is this, and I at the first opportunity, I had to condemn you, I didn't, I forgave you. Sure. Therefore you, at the first opportunity to condemn somebody else, as others. a pattern to be like me, you forgive other people. And if you don't, our relationship's gonna be in trouble. Yeah. And so many people I believe are not experiencing the fullness of what they could have in God and in their walk with Christ and in the strength and power that God could be working in their life because so I'm to forgive. Yeah, they're just simply they've just not going to impediment. So God says, "Okay, until you echo what I've already done in you, until you do that, we're not in agreement. And until we're in agreement, I can't I can't do what I want to do mm -hmm. in your life." So, so we forgive, we ask for forgiveness and we are forgiven and we are forgiven to forgive. So, do you think that when it comes to like forgiveness and stuff in in relation to prayer, based on scripture, we know several other places that, you know, it, it talks about how if you're making a sacrifice to the temple and you have a quarrel with your brother, yeah. go settle the quarrel, then yeah. come leave your sacrifice to the altar, yeah. come settle the quarrel, yeah. then give the sacrifice. Don't give the sacrifice, then go, no, 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 go, then give the sacrifice. Do you think that, that that's a more of a hindrance uh, between like a like an obstacle between us and God, or you think that's more so God saying, "I will not talk to you when you're like this." I think I think what God's saying is is He's saying that my body and my and the head and the body of Christ are synonymous. So in other words, when when the apostle Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and he says, "Why are you persecuting me?" Paul had ah, never actually met Jesus, right? But he'd been so he couldn't have persecuted Jesus physically, right? So he, but he persecutes other believers. Persecutes the church, and so Jesus, sure. Jesus talks as if he and the believers are one. Are one, sure. And in the same way, God is saying that you can't be discombobulated and out of place with my body, and then have a conversation with the head. So and essentially, everything's gonna be good. you can't be crossways with another believer that's and right. expect that's not going to be a problem for you and God, because the body of Christ is the body of Christ. Wow. Okay. So, so he he all that is pulled together. So my willing first of all, me being forgiven by the okay. head okay. means that I forgive in the body. Unity to God is a very incredibly important thing. If okay. you think about the price he paid for that, right? He pray, think about the price he paid to forgive us. Period. Right. So he was willing to die for that. So that forgiveness is really important. He was willing to die so that he could forgive us. He expects you to take that as seriously as he does for. For, for mm. as he did for us, as we would for other people. Well, and so, it's, it's Ephesians five where it talks about you know it speaks for husbands and wives, but I think it's true for everybody, which is that you know it talks about husbands loving their wives as Jesus loved the church, which absolutely. is that you know he's willing to die for it. It's like that's a sacrificial love. And don't you remember that he said also that that when you're crossways with your wife, it could be a hindrance to your prayers. Yeah. yeah he so does again, say that. Yeah. we're still back in that same circle, circle yeah. where he's saying that you you don't get to have and people do this. People sometimes think, well, I get to have a relationship with God. God, everything's going to be fine, but I don't have a, have to have a relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Sure. It's not true. So, sure. So anyway, there's that. Verse <laughs> 6. <laughs> Keep going. We just so had... essentially there was a siren going off in the hallway. Both of us are, I highly doubt these picked it up. There was a siren going off in the hallway. It's still going off. And Jimmy, one of our guys, comes I walking no out. Pay no attention to it. To it. <laughs> <laughs> verse 16. I guess we're good. Here we go. Yeah. 16. Verse 16. It says, and when you fast, again, remember what he said, when you pray? Yeah. So and that when you fast. So what he's saying is, is that a normal behavioral pattern of a Christian is a Christian talking to God. Typical assumption that Jesus is making is that you that, pray and that you do fast. At that's some point exactly or right. That's exactly right. So we pray and we fast, yep. which by the way, if you think prayer in private is, is something that we uh, basically disown and don't do, Fasting, fasting is on a whole nother level. Yeah. Which we have a full podcast episode on fasting. I'll yep. link it in this video. Yes, good. So, That's yeah. good. It says, don't make it obvious as the yep. hypocrites do. So in other words, once again, when you fast or whatever you're doing, whenever the activity or the event or the people around you become the subject and God is not the subject, it's still going, wah, wah, I don't wah. get going, sorry. Um, it, 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 and if, and God stops being the subject, it's at that particular moment that it becomes ineffective. Yeah, if your desire is to impress or to um, make yourself look a certain way in prayer or fasting, <laughs> stop laughing at it. <laughs> but if, if, it, if that's your desire, then obviously you've taken Jesus 
off the forefront. I think prayer, in, in, and again, like we said earlier, prayer in its simplest form would be a, a direct message from you to God. But I do believe that the best thing we can do a lot of times is eliminate the distractions between us and God and the way that we're distracted in it. I agree. The Speaking distractions. Of distractions, God, we are so ADD today. The energy drinks did not help a lick. Keep going. <laughs> But he goes on to say, when you fast, you comb your hair and you do all those things. Now, verse 18 is important, though. Yep. He says, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father. So here, here's an important thing. God wants nothing to be the subject in our communion with him yep. other than himself. Mm. So prayer, the primary side of prayer is God wants that to be us speaking to him. Sure. The primary side of fasting is is us beckoning God for something. Yeah, giving but, something up for him. That's right. But God is nonetheless the subject. So that's why in fasting, it's it's. I think it's a mistake that we make sometimes. We get all wrapped around the axle about what we're not doing anymore. We're not eating this or we're going to give up TV or whatever. Um, you really need to be careful with that because you basically rendered ineffective when the food becomes the subject. Sure. The fast should be, I need to talk to my father. And I'm willing to give up something yeah, in order to get that. To show him how important he is, is yeah. and his answer is to yep. me. I agree with that. Um, and he says, so what you do in private, um, so so he knows what you do in private, rather. Um, and your father who sees everything, here's what he says, he'll reward you. So so Jesus has given us the what I believe is the, the, the fundamental pattern of, of prayer. So how do you pray? I think you go by this pattern. Yeah. Um, I don't think that the, the I don't think that the model prayer was given to us as a um something to quote. No. Well, and it's crazy how many religious circles just cite that prayer yeah. and just say the words. And it's like, and I, I heard a quote and it it was so good. It said it was it said in prayer, it's better, and I don't know who this was. I'd I'd give them credit, but I don't know who it was. But it, it's it's it said in prayer, it is better to be heart without words than it is to be words without heart. That's good. And I think that the a lot of times the Lord's prayer is recited, and that's great that you know it. That's awesome. It's just like reciting scripture, or scripture's great. At the same time, if it's words without heart, then at the end of the day, but it's not really growing you closer. The very God thing that He said, He said, "Don't say the same things over and over and that's over." That's what over. He said. Yeah, and then that's we are. Very, yeah, the very thing He's saying, He said not to do by quoting the Lord's prayer. You're violating you're what He said. Yeah. So it's kind of a kind of a weird deal. But how do we pray? God Follow is the subject. Up. Honor God first. You know, present your request to him, but still, you know, work, walk and forgiveness. Those yep. types of things. Those are things that yep. that would be model pieces of of prayer. Um, you've also got we've also got on here a method, you know, yep. prayer method. There's there's four that we have here. You know, where should I pray? Mm -hmm. Um we already covered one, which yep. is in private. Yep. Um obviously you pray in private. Every Christian should be praying in private to some degree. I don't think we necessarily have to put a there's not necessarily an amount of time that you're like, hey, you should have at least five hours. Again, that sort of makes that the subject of like, oh, I need to get my five hours. Like that's that's a problem for me personally. I'm like, hey, I agree you should be praying a lot, but I, I don't necessarily would say people like, well, how much is a healthy prayer? Like how many, how much time? It's like, well, yeah, but if I give you a time frame, that's all you're going to think about. It's like, sure. well, I got to get my five hours or else I'm not holy. And it's like, sure. yeah, it's not really what it's about. It, it's about prayer. Don't make it about the time frame. Make it about praying. Um, you know, there's times where, you know, I've talked about this where, you know, there's times where you need to hear from God, which means that you you pray, you pray till you hear. It's like, uh, it may be three hours. It may be whatever. It may be 30 minutes. It's whatever it is. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to pray. But that praying in private, Matthew 6, 5 through 6, hammers this home. He says, you know, go to your room, close the door. Um, you know, be in private. I think that should be a part of your prayer life. I, I do think, though, that that setting aside time where you it's open ended, where you don't have to be thinking about what's next. Sure. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you're going out on a date night with your wife, okay. So um, if you set the the bookend of that when you've got to get back home pretty early then the date is only part of it. And then the rest of it, you're thinking about, I got to get back. Yeah. What if you set aside time with God? And I don't want to say date because that sounds weird. But what I'm saying though is- I think it's actually pretty close to how it's was, supposed to be you, though. But if it was kind of like that where you said, okay, you know, Friday afternoon, um, I'm off this week and I'm just going to go and I'm just going to spend time praying. Sure. We don't do that, but we should. If we did, and let's just say, let's just say we got alone with God and we spent a, a, a good period of time Sure. Couple that with journaling and, you know, reading your Bible. Um, I, I just think that those are the kind of things that 
we're missing out on because we don't we don't make that kind of provision like, you know, we know that a relationship is rich when we put time in it. But our relationship with God should be rich. Well, what if I, I just said I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going home early today and I'm just going to spend some time with the Lord. Yeah. Well, and how many times do we consider our relationship with God like a physical relationship? Yeah, if yeah. you if you walked up to your spouse, there's times where a quickie date between something like is is cool that you're making time for them in between something. Like I've had times where, you know, I'll get done with first service and I'll be like, Nicole, you know, I want to hang out with you for 10 minutes. You know, I got 10 minutes. I got to speak again, but I'd like 10 minutes with you. And that, and that's really cool. That's awesome. At the same time, if I walked up to my wife on date night and I said, Hey, we're going to dinner. Um, but I only have an hour. And at the end of this hour, I got to go. It's like, it just doesn't make the relationship feel like it's really... <laughs> and you're on your phone the whole time? Yeah, everybody... Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Or you're thinking about something else yeah. or whatever else. It's like, you know, if I treated my wife that way, it would obviously frustrate my wife. Sure. She may not be mad at me because she loves me. She's like, hey, sure. I understand that. But at the same time, my wife's like, okay when am I going to get some time with you? You know, I'm not trying to be pushy. I just, when am I going to get some time? If we treat our relationship with God, not saying you treat God like your spouse, but more so if you looked at God and said, Hey, this prayer time is also investing in my relationship with God. I need to set intentional time aside that maybe I don't have a bookend on. And I'm like, Hey, yeah, this is time for God. And I protect it where it's like, like I would a date night where it's like, Hey, if you let that get over scheduled, think about how much it frustrates your wife or how much strain it would put on your marriage. Maybe it doesn't frustrate her, but if you don't spend time with her, that's going to mess your marriage up. And it's like, man, that's, that's a lot to to pay for a lot of sacrifice. Heaven's not supposed to be when we get there should not be a place where you're being introduced to God as sure, if he's a stranger. Sure. If you've spent your life engaging that, which by the way, if you'll remember, Jesus said in the day when judgment comes, he said there'll be these people that said we did all these religious activities. Right. But what he said to them was this. He says, yeah, but I'll tell them to turn from me, you worker of iniquity. I for never knew you. I yeah. never knew you. And so what if, let's just say, for instance, who's somebody you look up to that you'd be like, man, if I could meet that person, that would be cool. Uh, who's alive today? Yeah, because I was I was about to say Kobe Bryant would be cool, but yeah, um, unfortunately, but uh, but yeah, um, somebody I really look up to, I think would be cool. Um, I think Craig Rochelle would be awesome to me. Okay, Craig Rochelle, cool guy. Yeah. So what if what if Craig Rochelle was available for you to meet him? Yeah. Um, think about how quickly you would jump on that. Yeah. And think about my schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And think about how, if Craig said, man, I would, you know, I'm off every Friday afternoon. If you wanted to come by and hang out and talk, how many of those Friday afternoons would you take advantage of? Sure. You know, a bunch. Well, it's because you want them to know you. When we have a chance to have an audience with God Almighty, sure. Why don't I take that time? Sure. And go. I want you to know me. Sure. I want you to know me. Absolutely. I, and you know how you're gonna know me? I'm gonna tell you everything. Absolutely. I know you know all things because I know you're my father. But I'm gonna tell yeah. you just. About, my mom tells me the same stories over every over <laughs> and over every single week. I'm gonna tell you this because I want you to know. I, I do think that setting setting aside time as you would for any other relationship that's this important. Um, is really, really, really a significant thing. Oh, absolutely. Well, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is that Jesus tells is the story of the uh, the ten bridesmaids, where he talks about how you know they that there's these ten women that are essentially waiting on the bridegroom, which is the the man, and he's going to come back. And whoever's lamp is lit, essentially, is that the the theory of the story is that whoever's lamps are lit, um, he's going to take them to the wedding, and everybody else has to stay. You don't you don't get to go if your lamp's not lit. And um, the interesting part of the story is that when the bridegroom comes, only three of the 10 bridesmaids were prepared. They had enough oil to keep the lamps burning yeah, all yeah, that yeah. long. Um, the other seven bridesmaids were called uh, lazy or whatever, and they didn't have enough oil. And so they went to town to buy oil. And while they were gone, the bridegroom returns. He takes the three. They go to the wedding. And the other seven pursue him. But obviously, they don't They don't get there in time. And when they get to the wedding, though, what's interesting to me about this story is when they get to the wedding, they knock on the door. And he comes to the door and he says, he says, um, apart from me for I never knew you, which is the same, the same yeah, thing yeah. he says there. What's interesting is he never mentions the lamp. Mm. He never says, your lamps weren't lit. I'm sorry. You mm. didn't have your lamps lit. That's good. That's not what he says. He says, he says, I never knew you, which makes you wonder, did they really have to have their lamps lit? Or was that just what they thought they needed? 
And that was an action that made them feel religious when at the end of the day, really, it was about a relationship with the bridegroom. That's good. Had nothing to do with the lamps. That's and good. so prayer is this is this idea, and praying in private is this idea that I'm ditching all this other religious activity in order, it, I'm trading it in for a actual relationship, which is when you look at scripture, he says, apart from me, for I never knew you. He doesn't say, apart from me, you weren't, you were sinful. He doesn't say, apart from me, you weren't a great Christian or you weren't a great mom or a great dad or you weren't a great whatever. He says, apart from me, I didn't know you. And so it's like, part of me says, you know, sin is a, is a part of life, or whatever. No doubt we should make war with it. But what Jesus is saying is that I never relation with you. I don't know you. How do I get to know you? Well, prayer would be the, probably the primary way. I think so too. And I think too, when you think about when, when we looked at the model prayer, you know, one of the things he talked about was walking in forgiveness and those kind of things. So that means that it's not just, although it is getting alone in your yeah. prayer closet, but it's not just that. If forgiveness is a part of prayer, forgiveness is an activity. That means that there's things that I do that is a message to God intentionally. 100%. So, so I mean, as I forgive somebody, I'm praying. Yeah. I'm giving God a statement. Yeah. You know, um, as I love people, I'm praying. I'm giving God a statement. I'm sharing a statement with God. In addition to the the actual verbalization of prayer, by the way that I live my life. The second way that we... I was going to say, we got way off topic yeah, there, go. but private <laughs> private prayer is the first method. The That's second right. one is... Go off to it. It's with, it's with your family. Yep. Um, and I think you look at that the same way Jesus did. Jesus gave us instruction about prayer. That's yep. what that model prayer we just looked at. But then he modeled prayer. Yeah. So the disciples, not only did they get instruction, this is how you should pray. Sure. But they saw him pray. Sure. And that should happen in our family. Um, one of the things I can confess is that I never saw or heard my dad pray my whole sure. life. And, you know, I'd love to have seen that, you know. I know I know he did. Um, not a lot, but I know he did. I know it, when it was most important, he did. I know my dad's in heaven. I believe that with all my heart. But I will say this. I never got a chance to hear my dad pray. Sure. Uh, and so there's times you don't really know. When someone prays, and it's not role-playing, but when someone prays, you hear what they really think about God. Sure. And you see this relationship. And that needs to be modeled in our families. Um, moms and dads need to be doing it. Um, I, you know, we, in our family, it's always been a part of who we are and your kids need to see it. Your wife and your husband needs to, you know, to see it. And, but you pray in your family. I think that the private prayer is that primary, primary prayer. We need to be doing that because that's our relationship with God. I think we need to be praying our family. Well, there's no better way to, to, to model, you know, prayer than to pray with your kids. I mean, absolutely. No, they, they are already under your influence. Yeah. They're already under your control or whatever. Um, you know, and, and we do it with our kids, Nicole and I do with our four and they, at first they didn't really understand it, but now they want to pray. And it's amen. like, they don't, they don't really know. Yeah, exactly. Hey, amen. They don't know, they don't know what they're doing and they're saying, but amen. they've seen us do it though. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, Hey, dad, I love it. dad does it. Mom does it. Whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to pray. And they, Austin, you want to pray? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love amen. it. Amen. Yeah, they pray, amen. they pray for other people. They'll list people's names because they've heard us do it. And it's yeah. like, you know, those are things that while they may not fully understand what's going on and we wouldn't yeah. hold that to them as kids at the same time you know when they get older they'll be like i remember my parents praying yeah. with me i, I remember that I, how, because how did how did they learn how to walk yeah by taking chunky weird steps and falling down how'd they learn how to talk by using weird words and miss sure yeah how do you learn how to do anything yeah i think it's you're exactly exactly right so you model it with or you pray with your family the third one is in your small group Yep. And now Matthew 18, um, 19 through 20 is a verse that's taken out of context most of the time. <laughs> this is talking about church discipline. Mm -hmm. So you have to take the whole verse in right. this context. Was, this is not, hey, if a couple of y'all get together and you decide something, God ain't got no choice but to do it. That's, <laughs> right. that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, is that you, you bring two people together for the discipline. But it's showing you, though, and I do think the heart of this is, is that and there's this special place that God is in the community of his people. Sure. And praying together as God's people is important. Sure. And I would say that in a small group is a really important thing. Um, the fourth thing is in worship and during the message. This is something I think a lot of people miss. You're not supposed to be a benign part of the worship service. When, wow. the, yeah. when the worship is taking place, that's an opportunity for you to be talking to God. Yeah. There are times in a worship service I'll be so enamored by the goodness of God and yeah. the power of God. And I and it and it's stirred because the worship team is is helping me. They're they're helping me kind of walk into some things. They're helping me flush out some stuff that's had me distracted. Sure. And I can pray and talk to God during that time. But you can do that during the message. Absolutely. You know, there's times when when someone's speaking and they'll say something and I'll go, Lord, thank you for that. I didn't even consider that. Thank you. Yeah. You don't have to be just like a knot on a log. 
Yeah. You're, you're active in that service, man. Be praying, be talking yeah. to God and, and a chance you have to do that. And we use Philippians four five through seven, you know, um, and everything by prayer, everything, everything yeah. with Thanksgiving, man. And I can't think of a better place than in the services to do that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, and, and in yeah, in worship, and I think in the service, there's nothing better too than getting in a room full of like-minded people where yep. you're all pursuing the same thing, a relationship with God. I desire to be closer to Him, and so do these people. Yep. And when you're together, there's just something about that. And I think worship services are really designed to be opportunity. When you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, you're no longer really a consumer in the service completely at least that's right no doubt you're being taught no doubt you're consuming the worship no doubt that's happening at the same time though you're you're also engaging where you're you're doing 100%. stuff you know someone who's brand new to the church who's not a believer even or maybe is a brand new christian they may be just there to consume right now they're like they're absorbing it like a sponge yeah but when you're someone who's been around for a while and you've done those things you're like man i've been here i've been to the worship services I've, right. I've whatever else you know again th that means that not all this is for you just to consume anymore it's time right. for you to move off of you know, baby food and you start yep. kind of chewing on something a little bigger. That's kind of what this looks like. So could we, what could, what, what could we pray for? So yep. what should, what, what are some contents, possible contents of our prayer, which by the way, I don't believe that the Bible tells us, and I've seen people do this where they lay out like a pattern, like you've got to ask for this and do this and it's in this order and da, da, da. Yep. I don't really believe that that's actually how it works. Um, I do believe the model prayer Jesus gave us that says that God maintains his role and position regardless of what we're doing, asking or saying. I think that is important. But I think as far as like the contents of your prayer, they don't have to be in the perfect order. No, it's I not, think I think you'd I think God would would more so value your um authenticity in prayer yeah, than yeah, he yeah. would than he would necessarily you trying to sugarcoat or cookie coat yep. which say Joshua is a prime example when the people of Israel come out of Egypt and they come into the promised land they come up to a place called Ai and Ai they've been dominant you know Joshua and these guys they've been doing great and uh, they're That's back not, on and track and it's not artificial intelligence no either. no no they're a place called Ai but Ai whoops their rear end I mean it what they whooped the Israelites it says they chased them down the mountain and slaughtered them as they went so the Israelites get their tail whooped mm -hmm. And Joshua comes out of that battle, though, and he rips his clothes. And he goes, and essentially, he looks at God and he goes, what the heck, dude? Like, yeah. you brought us all the way out here just for us to get slaughtered by an enemy that we should have conquered? What are you doing? Which is essentially what Joshua asked, which sounds arrogant, but I really think that the way Joshua's asking it is he's saying, God, I'm confused. I don't understand what we're supposed to be doing. Everything That's pointed. Good. We prayed. We got ready. We're doing exactly what you told us to do. I'm leading the people in that direction, and we got got stomped what's wrong is essentially what josh was asking because he doesn't know at that point god reveals to joshua that there's something wrong in their camp that joshua didn't know about and so that you know they get this guy called aiken and they throw him in a pit and they kill him because he did something really wrong but in that though you look at this and you go i think that is what god truly desires not necessarily the frustration but i think god desires authenticity in prayer where it's like hey joshua's alone he gets alone with god and he's honest. He's like, God, I don't, I don't understand. I'm not saying there's not anything wrong. I'm saying, I don't see it. Show it to me. I th and, and God's I, willing to do that. And there's a lot of people in scripture that you can look at as such good mentors for prayer. Yeah. I think, I do think Moses, Moses for sure, you know, cause that's where Joshua got it from. You Absolutely. got Moses, you that's got Joshua, mentor. you got Daniel. Yeah. You know, you, you watch these got Joseph, you watch Daniel's these. the first guy in scripture that I really hear who has oh. a consistent, he has a consistent prayer routine. Oh, hundred percent. He's the only one I've ever heard of that has a yeah. consistent, it says yeah. every day he prayed and he prayed in this way. And I was like, man, I, yeah. I've never seen anybody do that. Corey Ten Boone said, make an appointment with God and keep it. Amen. <laughs> That's what you did. That's what he Daniel did. did. Let me tell he you. Did. Yeah. So in your prayer life, you can ask for something. Yeah. When you pray, you can. That's not the only thing that your prayer should be about, but you can ask for something. Matthew 7, 7. You can praise God in your yeah. prayer. You can celebrate. And you know what? Your prayer doesn't have to have all these things in it. It sure. doesn't have, it could have one or the, it could have some of them, but, but I do think praise is important. Praise, yeah. praise is where we begin to evaluate the value of God in, in our, our lives. Life. And yeah. again, it keeps him in that position. I you can it. thank God. Yeah. I mean, prayer could be an inventory, man. There's nothing wrong with just stopping and going, man, let me, let me go back. Yeah. You know, our marriage has gone through these many things. Here's where God brought us through this. And he brought us through this and brought us through this. You want to, you want to beef up your, your faith for tomorrow. Go back and inventory what God did God's yesterday. Already done, yeah, yeah. So you can thank God. You can confess your sins. You know yeah. that inventory of and being ruthless. It's not going to do you any good to pretend. Yeah, no. I mean, it's not like God's going, "Oh, wow, I didn't know that." Yeah, 
You shocked you know? me. Yeah, no. <laughs> but the other thing you can do, and this may surprise you, you can even gripe. That's what yeah. you were talking about. Yeah. You can gripe. Psalms 142, 1 and 2 says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before yeah. him, and I tell my trouble before him. Yeah. We had a series a few months ago, I think, even that we talked about complaining, and we talked about the only kind of complaining that's okay is complaining you do to God. Yeah, where it's like, hey, I, I bring these things to you, and I'm like, God, I don't get it. What's yep. what what's going on? That doesn't mean that you you somehow criticize God for the way He's doing things, but God's the only one in control of the situation. No, no doubt about which it. Which is when Joshua comes to God, Joshua doesn't know what's wrong, but he knows that God does, and so he's like. You know, but I don't. Can you tell me what's yep. what 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 do we do? And sure enough, God's like, here's what you did. That's right. You, you got a guy that took some stuff out of Jericho they weren't supposed to take, and it's that's like right. that. You know, that's what happened. And so he he confesses that to him. So it's a it's an interesting thing. But but I do think that prayer doesn't necessarily have to have a, a, a certain nuance or whatever to it. But these are things that you can do in prayer. I can praise God. I can thank Him. Absolutely. I can I can ask Him for things, things that I may need, things that I may think I need. It's situations I need clarity in. Where I'm like God. I need clarity here. I don't understand. Um, there were several times when we were restarting that church cabinet when it first got started, things would happen and I would go back to prayer and I'd be like, God, I don't get it. Why, why, yeah. what, 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 what are we doing? What do I need to do? I don't even understand if I'm supposed to be happy, mad, sad about this situation. What, what do I need to do to make this work? You know, and that, I think those are, that's prayer requests that you can, or not prayer requests, but pieces of prayer that you can absolutely have. Let's skip down to prayer secrets because I think okay. that fits where we're at. And um, let's walk through a couple of few. Are there some secrets to prayer? Well, one of them, one of we the may secrets. We have to do a secondary <laughs> podcast on this one. There's a lot we just one, skipped. One Keep of the going. things that um, that we may have heard before is that when we pray in Jesus' name, um, that we're going to get it. And and they get that from John chapter 14 and verse 14 says, Jesus said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will we'll do, do it. it. Now, that's a pretty profound statement. Yeah. Unless you understand what my name means and what he's mm. talking about. Okay. So when we pray in Jesus' name, it is not a magic open sesame statement. It's sure. not rubbing the genie's bottle. And and as we've said before, and I'm going to say it once again, because I'm talking to God, God does not relinquish his, relinquish his position as being God. Sure. He is still sovereign. So... So when we're praying in Jesus' name, what does that mean? That means I'm praying a prayer that Jesus would sign his name to. Sure. Think about a check. Sure. The reason why the bank will cash your check, which most of you young people don't even know what a check is, is <laughs> a piece of paper. We used to fill them out and we put our name at the bottom. <laughs> but what that means is, is that let's just say your PIN number. Sure. That, that, that is authorization that the bank can pay that out. When you pray in Jesus' name, it is authorization that heaven can pay it out. But you have to make sure that what you're asking for and what you're praying for, Jesus would sign his name to it. Yeah, aligns, sure. You know, and when it's that, Jesus said, bring it. Sure. Let's go. We'll fill it. We'll do it. Um, well, and even to say that, like th there are times where things that you ask for may be in accordance with God's will or be in accordance with, you know, God's standard, but they may not be in accordance with God's will where God's like, Hey, this is not what I'm going to do right sure, now. Sure, sure, that's You right. have to understand Stand there is good. absolutely a will that's over and above and, and prayer may be the submission of my requests, but again, in the submission of my request, it's not just the submission as in I'm handing them in. It's also the submission as in I'm submitting myself and this request to you and how you desire to handle it is up to you. And Jesus did that. He yeah. said, you know, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, will be done. Your will yep. be done. So you, whatever you can sign your name to God, I believe that's best and I'll do it and yep. I'll carry through with it. And I'll be submitted to it. That's exactly right. So there's two other secrets that we would say, and we've already addressed one of these, where two or three are in agreement. That's that's one of those where we believe that if we have two people, we force God to do something that maybe he doesn't want to do. That's not how it works. Right. That's not really a secret. I do believe God is present in a unique way um, when we gather together with his people. I do believe that that is true, but it, God doesn't stop being God just because we gather together. Praying scripture. Uh, someone will say, well, I found a verse of scripture that confirms this. You should do that. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel did that. If Should you if, pray the Bible? Yes. Yeah. You remember when Daniel said, you know, your your word said that we would, you know, only be in bondage this amount of time right. and it, it's starting to come to an end. Interesting piece about that. Almost every prayer in scripture is beckoning God to do what he already said he would do. That's almost right. every prayer. That's right. Daniel is chief among them, but almost every prayer. But really, if you look at that again, you're they're praying in Jesus name, if mm -hmm. you will, because what they're doing is praying in harmony with God's timing and God's will and God, what, right. what is God, what God wanted. Yeah. So which you taught that and the, my journey stuff, that God's great desire, God's greatest desire. And I think that prayer is one of those things where when 
if I am not already aligned with God's greatest desire, the more that I pray, the more yeah. likely that I will That's become right. aligned with his great desire. And as I become aligned with his great desire, my prayers will align with that desire, meaning what I want, what I desire starts to align with what God desires. And that's where I believe you, you're kind of in the perfect One, place. Absolutely. 100%. Matter of fact, in that verse where in Matthew chapter seven, seven, where Jesus tells us to keep asking and, and knocking and right. he's not saying be repetitious, but what he's saying is your consistency, again, praying consistently, your consistency in prayer doesn't guarantee you get what you want, but your consistency in prayer guarantees that your heart is aligned with what God wants. Sure. And when that happens, then you get, when the Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart, when your heart's in alignment with what God wants, guess what? It's, you're going to get it. You want to know why? Because God's will is always going to be done. Sure. What God is going to do is God's going to do. And the more that you pray, the more that you're, that that prayer is not moving God, it is moving you. That's it's right. moving me That's into right. alignment with God where I'm like, hey, I'm, not, I'm out of alignment with God. And the more time that I spend with him and the more prayer that I spend, more time in prayer that I spend with him, the more that God is able to maneuver me in alignment with himself. That's it, right. It's not, it's not maneuvering him where God's like, oh, now now I'm more aligned with your yeah. desires. He's it's going, like, oh, that's right. Yeah, Thank you've you, got Kendall. this figured out. I'm oh, glad. Let me, let you know. me, Gabriel. <laughs> let me write that down. Kendall, Kendall's got a request. <laughs> He's so smart. Um, um, no, yeah, but but more so it's God aligning me with where I'm supposed to be. And yeah. so and I think that's where we misunderstand a lot of times prayer. I think it's what we said for, for many years is we said that, you know, when we pray, sometimes God changes the circumstances, but when we pray, every time God changes us. That's right. And so that constant relationship brings my heart where it needs well, to be. And, and I read something. It was Leonard Ravenhill was the one who said, he said, he said, a sinning man will stop praying, but a praying man will stop sinning. And there's this mm, idea that, that's good. that man, you know, because of our fallen state, there's a lot of times where we will drift away from God. Now, God never drifts away from us. Mm -hmm. We drift away from God. But if we will start praying, that will move us back towards him. And as we move closer to him, that you're less likely to be engaged in sin and all those other things. Well, then wouldn't you say the same thing is true is that there's a correlation between my rich prayer life and the faith that I have. I agree. Yeah. So you have people that go, man, I'm struggling in my faith. It, it, how's your prayer life? Are you praying? Because, yeah. because I, I think it was... Um, I think it was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said, he said that I pray out of obedience until my heart comes into alignment. Yeah. And he said, sometimes that takes an hour or more. Yeah. So in other words, I'm praying before I feel it, but I'm going to keep praying because I know that it's effective. And the longer I pray, the more my heart comes around and I get in alignment with what God's saying. Yeah. I get in, I get into where God's directing me. I submit to it. Prayer is the answer to that. So when you have a weak faith or you have a weak walk with God or you got temptations just bearing down on you, really losing a lot of those battles, how rich is your prayer life? You, we're waiting to feel it before we pray about it. But God says, if you don't pray about it, you're never going to never going to you're it. never going to feel it. The other part doesn't well, come in alignment. It was George Mueller who they I was studying this as we got ready for this podcast. George Mueller was talking about the um, oh he's so good. the rooftop the rooftop uh, prayer revival where they were taking these orphanages all around the world after I think it was World War II where they were talking about you know they couldn't get these kids into houses they had no rooms for them. All, all their parents had been killed at war. All their parents have been killed at war. There's nowhere for these kids to go. Thousands and of so. Them. Um, um, they would they would gather people on top of their houses and they would pray. And during this time, the the greeting that Christians had instead of good morning or hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. their greeting was, "Are you praying earnestly?" Man. And it's like, so they didn't ask each other like, "Hey, how are you?" It's, That's "Are you so are you praying earnestly?" Was the question. And it's like, do, we do should you greet think, that way. We should. And and well, and do you think you know they're, they're they're not greeting each other that way because they're saying, "Hey, um, we all have this idea that prayer is going to make us better." It's more so that they're saying, "Hey." Number one, we have a request that is in alignment with God's heart. You know, these kids, God cares about these kids. That's right. And, and that's in alignment with his, his word. That's in alignment with his heart. And all of us are showing that we're in alignment with that by our earnest prayer. And we're yeah. saying, hey, this matters to all of us just like it does to you. And it's this good. is what we need. And that, you know, I think with prayer, when it comes down to it, you know, uh, what you have to do is a you've got to be in accordance with God's word and B, you've got to be in accordance with God's heart. But, you know, with that, I think as a church and as a society we need to push each other to pray that you Words know that individual prayer yeah yeah that's so, so good you're right you're exactly right so sixthly which yeah. we skipped a couple of the others we did so, we skipped so like three but that's okay. four <laughs> um what can prayer accomplish i love what Corey ten boom said she said she said faith sees the invisible believes the unbelievable and receives the impossible amen yeah <laughs> well that's good that is good so so looking at, at people in the bible 
um, that were effective in prayer. We have yep. Elijah. Yep. He prayed for it to not rain, and it didn't. Three yep. years. Three years of no rain. rain. And, then, and then when he prayed again, that's right, it, rained. it immediately rained. Yeah. Yep. Jesus, look how effective he was in yep. prayer. He prayed someone back to life. Yep. He prayed people to see. He prayed a couple loaves and some fish, turned into a heck of a dinner for, people, for yeah. thousands of people. More than 5,000, um, yeah. Yeah. And over and over, you see, he Jesus actually prayed for us. Yeah. You know, and he prayed for us even right now, and we're still effective. Moses, his prayers yeah. were effective, and you've got some other, just just prayer moments, and even in American history that that have been amazing. Yeah, really quickly, I just want to glance over is the Haystack Revival, which was essentially a group of five college students that gathered outside their school um, to pray, and then it started raining, so they ran underneath the haystack to be able to get protected from the rain. Well, these five college students met together every day underneath that haystack to pray, and they're praying about one thing. They're praying about foreign missions. They said, hey, man, foreign missions is important. There were no foreign mission sending agencies in America at the time. No missionaries, which is crazy. America is the number one foreign mission sending country in the world and has been for decades. But at this point, there were none. Not That's one incredible. missionary was leaving. But these five college students, just five kids, they started praying. Three more kids joined them, so they got to eight. That took them three years to get eight kids total. <laughs> they only get one kid per year. So pretty much what they got. But in with those eight students, three years later went to a, a Bible seminary where in that they established two foreign mission sending agencies and all eight of those students went on foreign missions Gosh. work. One of those students ended up working in Calcutta um, and worked ag across a couple of, of um, tribes there and made an incredible impact, translated the Bible into their language, reached over 6,000 people, uh, set up 136 other missionaries inside that same area. Where'd that all start? And that, and that was only one kid, by the way. I didn't count the other seven, plus the other people they reached, plus the foreign mission sending agency that they founded. Um, not, all, not all that we didn't even talk about, just that one kid and what he did. But that started with five kids praying underneath the haystack That's outside incredible. their college. And you're That's like, absolutely you know, and, and their thing was is that, um, their thing was is they prayed, they said uh, their, their slogan was, we, we can do it and we will. Yeah. And it's like, that was their thing. It's like, we can do it and we will. And it's That's like, good. we will do it and with no, you know, nothing, no charter, nothing was set up and they prayed through it and God just provided an incredible way. George Mueller's the same way. There's, there's a ton of things, but there was this, this cottage prayer meeting that happened and George Mueller was one to the Lord at this college, at this uh, cottage prayer meeting. And you go, man, George Mueller, one of the greatest you know, I would say in our time, one of the greatest leaders of the religious oh, movement. 100%. Um, you're talking about millions of children affected by George Mueller and the movement that he did. Uh, orphanages around the world established. Kids led to the Lord everywhere. Millions of people impacted. And George Mueller was one to the Lord. How? At a prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting, just a group of people coming together. And George Mueller didn't know God, didn't worship God, nothing. Came to that prayer meeting, said he was greeted like he'd never been greeted before and got saved that night. After Gosh. that, after that was unleashed on the world. I mean, Gosh. you're talking seven there they attribute seven point five million dollars to his prayers. So he prayed now, and, and seven point five million dollars was donated. That's in his time. In prayer. his time, yeah. yeah. So you're talking about you know, telling what kind of money you're talking about he raised. Yeah. And he never then, yeah, no. George Mueller never made a need ever verbally known. known. Yeah. Nope. And he said he did that he on purpose prayed. because he said that I'd never tell anybody about what I needed because he said the, the reason being I wanted to always be, and God told him to do this. He said God wanted him to always be confirmed that God was the one answering the prayers. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So, so, so the, I mean, but even back to the Bible, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter two comes yeah. about because the disciples are praying in the upper room at that time before the day of Pentecost happens. That's 3000 people saved, all the gifts, the Holy Spirit, all that came right out of them praying. Uh, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. Um, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, it says, during those days, uh, or during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. So they started groaning in prayer to God and that's when that's what the deliverance from Egypt came from is that, yeah. you know, they groan to God in prayer. So, so prayer, uh, prayer can accomplish a whole lot. In fact, I would say that I would dare say there is nothing that prayer cannot accomplish. Um, and I think that the sad part about the society that we live in is that, like you said earlier, prayer is kind of a last resort instead of a first response. Think about this for a second. Prayer is the only link between God and his creation yeah. that designates that he's the one doing it. So, so yeah. in other words, let me, so let's say for instance, Sammy Joe goes, Sammy Joanne goes to the hospital, 
nobody prays. Yeah. She's an unbelieving family. And the same things happen in her life that happened in her life. It would be marked up as good luck. Yeah. It'd be marked up as medical technology. Yeah. Although the medicals, they're calling us to get hospice. Yeah. We may have been know, right. a funeral. So that'd be hard to blame it on them. Right. They, they'd already given up. But because of prayer, it, it, it puts the keynote reality that we know that God did it. We spoke to God. We asked him as he asked us to ask him. And therefore, we can give him the glory for it because we can see that he did it. Yep. You know, otherwise, stuff's going to be written up as happened An for a lot of different reasons. Sure. You know, so God gets the credit whenever you pray. That's Absolutely. exactly right. So what's the mistakes in what's prayer? What's the greatest mistake? Greatest mistake. I'm going to get to that greatest mistake. Let me say one more thing. I think some people will say, well, I don't really know what to pray for. I don't know how to pray and all those kind of things. And we've given a bunch of input sure. for this. But one of the things you can have assurance in, in Romans 8, 26, it says this, likewise, the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Mm. And so the Bible tells us very clearly that God actually will help you. If you're willing to engage in prayer, regardless of what things you notice, ask for or not, if you're willing to engage in prayer, the Holy Spirit, God, the Spirit, he's going to help you. Yeah. He's going to give you the words. He's going to intercede for you. And you know what? Whatever needs to be asked for, whatever needs to be said, he's going to help you say it. And so that's Amen. a powerful thing. Amen. So so what is the greatest, absolute greatest mistake in prayer? This is the number one mistake that, that Christians make, and it is the one thing that makes your prayers absolutely ineffective. What is it? Not praying. Mm. That's the number one mistake, is that we do not pray. Cortin Boom said, uh, he, she said that, um, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. A man is powerful on his knees. And, and that's absolutely true. And we're commanded so many places in scripture to pray. Yeah. Uh, James 5, 6, and these are just, this is not even the Cliff's notes of it. James 5, 16, pray for one another that you may be healed. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Luke 22, 40, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Luke 18, 1, he told them a parable to effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Luke 6, 28, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Matthew 6, 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. And so over and over, we're told to pray. The practice of prayer is, it is wings. The, the, what, what, what wings are to a bird, prayer is to a, to a believer. Yeah. And we so need it, and we need to practice it, and we need to, you know, privately. Um, you know, you don't have to post it. You don't have to always yeah. go out and get somebody to be with you. I think we should pray. We've talked about that in community. We should pray in group. We certainly should pray in our family. I think that our prayer in community is ineffective if there's no prayer privately and personally. You know, I think even as pastors, yeah, we I as agree. pastors, when our effectiveness, um, I'll say this, God is going to be good regardless. Yeah. But I'll tell you this, you miss out on it. I agree. I miss out on it. Yep. So my prayer life personally is important. And you know what? It doesn't matter how spiritual someone might seem. It doesn't matter how powerfully religious someone might seem. The reality is, is that God has, through Jesus, given all of us access to himself. The same God is accessible to all of us, regardless of who we are, because of Christ. And we have the chance to to talk to him. And and man, what would happen if we just started practicing that? Yeah. Well, I mean, and if, if we started really practicing prayer, I mean, prayer is the seeking of God's face. And we talked about earlier, Second Chronicles, oh, what is it? 7.14. 7, yeah. Where it talks about, you know, if it, God says, if my people called by my name would humble themselves and seek my face, I would heal their land. Meaning That's right. that, you know, That's right. our land is broken right now. Everybody sees that. Everybody talks about that. And a lot of people, you know, I hear a lot of Christians, they kind of resign to the fact that they're like, well, it's just, that's just the way that it is, you know, because Revelation says the world's going to end. You're like, I'm not saying that's not necessarily true, but at the same time, I'll say this. Does that mean that if we started praying today that the world would not improve? It's like, I, I think you'd be out of your mind. I wonder mind. if Jesus would ask that. I wonder if he would look at us and say, do you want to be well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to Do, do you, you want to change? Yeah. Do you want it to be better? Or do you really just resign to that fact because you don't think you can? Sure. Or, or even more so, does it empower you? Because you don't Ooh. mean you have to do anything. Yeah. You know, if you, if you make a soft bed yeah, laying it. You know? Yeah. If your if your identity is hanging out with sick people and you like being among the sick people gripping about what we're sick about, if there was a solution, you know, does big pharma actually want people to get better? Sure. No, man, we sell a lot of pills because you're not getting better. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes we like gripping about stuff because that gives us an identity. Yeah. You know, but what happens if 
if God empowered you to do something, you're saying, hey, man, I want my neighbor to know Jesus. What if God said, okay, go over there and tell him about me? Oh, no, I just want him to know Jesus. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, so. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Well, guys, that is the podcast. What an incredible week. Um, this is going to be a really good one. Prayer is, is so powerful. If you get nothing else, my encouragement to you after watching this podcast is just start praying. Um, you don't have to have all the words. You don't have to know all the things. You don't have to whatever. There's no specific nuance or seance. You just you just start. Just start telling God. Tell him what's wrong. Tell him what's right. Thank him for what's good and tell him what's bad and just talk through it. That's right. And uh, it's, it's absolutely worth it. With that said, it's been an incredible week. We will see you guys. We're going to take a break next week. Uh, so we will not have a podcast drop next week over spring break. We're going to take that week off and we will see you guys the following week with a brand new podcast and some other stuff, some cool stuff up our sleeve. So thank you guys so much and we will see you guys on Sunday. It's good.